Hey everybody, this is Dwight Peters from QuarterWaters.com, the site for social entrepreneurs. Where social entrepreneurs come on the program, they talk about the issues they're tackling, the impact they're making, and share helpful business tips along the way. If you're watching this program, it's because you want to change the world, and you came to the right spot. So before we get started, and before Mark comes back, uh, I want to apologize to you guys. If you keep seeing me freeze up, it's because um, my computer is running low on memory. But you're going to see me occasionally freeze up, but don't worry, we're still here. Now, on today's program, I have with us the co-founder of the People's Movement, Mark Weistrack. Now, Movement is an eco-conscious, vintage-inspired maker of shoes and accessories that stands for the fight against single-use plastics. Mark, welcome to the program, man. <laughs> Thank you, Dwight. I'm grabbing some products. I figured, let's do it. Hey, why not? You know, uh, let people actually see what we're talking about, huh? Yeah, this is what we're talking about. This is what we make. The People's Movement is vintage-inspired, eco-conscious footwear, accessories, and soon-to-be uh, coming apparel. Awesome, man. This thing here you're seeing, Dwight, is um, a new boot. It's a sneaker boot. So Super high fashion, so uh, when you got got to get dressed up, you want that comfort. Um, this is coming out in two weeks, so i got to give a plug on it. But this is made with all organic cotton canvas, natural dyes, water-based glues, nickel-free eyelets, organic cotton laces. And then what you're seeing right here is um, actually upcycled plastic bags that we're cleaning from Bali. And we're using these um, sparingly on some models, but other models are actually starting to build entire shoes out of this upcycled plastic. Right. And the entire company... Movement is synonymous with the fight against single-use plastics. If there was one mission and goal that we could say that we stand for, we want to make single-use plastics illegal and ban them, and stop them from flowing into our environment, into our soil, into our water, and into our food chain. All right, Mark, you just sold me on that. My girlfriend would love to see me in one of those, so you know you could send me out a pair. I wear size 13. Thanks a lot. I'll tell you, Dwight, I'll be in um, I'll be in New York at the end of the month. So I'll link up and I'll <laughs> give you go. a big to bring you a pair of shoes. <laughs> Appreciate it, man. All right, Mark, so let's get into this, man. What is look good, do good, feel good? Well, look good, do good, feel good is our saying, and it was kind of um, our guiding points when we started the company. Um, when Kevin, my brother-in-law, uh, and I started the company, there was a bunch of defining factors that we wanted, but when we were trying to focus it, we said, okay, well, we want to start this company um, and we want it to be eco-conscious and we want it to stand for the fight against single-use plastics. Well, how do we do that and how, we do, how are we going to be successful at it? For us, first and foremost, we started with look good. Our product had to look good. Our logo had to look amazing. The website had to look beautiful. It had to be as a reverent and rock and roll as all of our other favorite brands that are out there that are, are you know making beautiful art but it doesn't really stand for something so we wanted to be the cool kids brand yeah. we are the cool kids brand we want to be as fresh and as edgy and daring as any of the other brands although we want to disguise in the second part the do good part so the do good was how we're gonna make um, all this what we're gonna make all these cool shoes like it looks really cool right and I could have very easily just made this out of leather and I could have made, you know, normal glues and I could have used, you know, cheaper materials and probably sold it for more. But instead we wanted to use more expensive materials and we want it was very important for us to um to encompass our, our beliefs, our morals, our goals. We want to try and and make a positive difference through the way we make our shoes through how we're cleaning plastic up from the ocean, and also what our company stands for. We're constantly um, acting as a catalyst for a ongoing conversation with our colleagues, um, with our customers, um, because we want to see the second industrial revolution. And we're also very humble in that as well. Like We know we're not, we're, man, we screw up all the time, and we're by no means are we perfect, but um, we'd like to be uh, in that conversation with everybody and, and moving all towards finding a better way to make our goods and a better way to sell them. So we have the look good. This product's got to look great. We got the do good. The product has to actually do good. You know, using um, more sustainable, eco-friendlier materials, and then also simultaneously cleaning up um, the plastic from the oceans. This is where our feel good comes in. 
the feel good is when we're we're getting into the action and getting involved and we're doing things like this like we sell these wallets this is made out of um roughly about 12 plastic bags that we've cleaned up from the island of bali um you can see it looks cool first it catches your eye it's a beautifully made wallet kind of looks like a cum digger sans wallet um and then it it does good it's made out of the good materials and then you combine those two together when you're looking good you're doing good or you're feeling good and the feeling good part too is we wanted to have fun doing this um we both uh turned down other big potentially high paying um gigs to come together and, and do this which is really just kind of a family family run small business along with our other partner uh Chris Swartwood who grew up with Kevin with my brother-in-law so it really is like three brothers doing this that's awesome man so we understand the whole feel behind it but um you know a little bit more detail how did this idea really come up and about like what what ideas were you guys throwing around and then what was the next step after that well, the idea is uh, Kevin Flanagan, our CEO, um, who really made this company happen. Um, Kevin was the VP of uh, of Reef and was working over at uh, VF Vanity Fair for years, and has about 16 years in the um, action sports world, working for the likes of Globe, working for Oakley, ASR trade shows. And when Kevin left Reef, you know he'd reached an age. Um, and, and, and a level of accomplishment where he was ready to start his own thing. And I had, years before, started a company called The People's Shoe, which was kind of the, the basis, the platform for what is now the people's movement. Um, initially, it was an idea where we had the shoe. It was inspired from the worker's shoe from, um, from Shanghai with my old partner. And we wanted to have this really cool kind of basic-looking shoe and put it in a tote bag and then give 10% away to charity. And it was a novel kind of idea, and the shoe looked really cool. The, the basis of the shoe was great. We got some great traction, and two kids from um, down in, you know, in, in Southern California had no clue what we were doing. We ended up you know, getting into 40, 50 stores. But we didn't really have the business, and we didn't have the focus, and the company at the end of the day didn't really stand for what my beliefs were. I was um, getting very involved into the environmental movement at the time, and I'd also um, met Captain Charles Moore, who's the... The famous captain who discovered the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, a patch of floating plastic Garbage. soup, if you will, that's out in the Pacific Ocean that is larger than the state of Texas. And um, I was also at the at the first meeting for the Plastic Pollution Coalition. And I met all these amazing um, artists and these lawyers and these activists and scientists and doctors and sailors that were dedicating their lives to try to educate the globe about single-use plastics. Um, once I got involved with that and started working with the NRDC and started um, you know, meeting a lot of other friends and, and now friends and colleagues that are environmentalists, quote unquote, I was determined um, when Kevin approached me and said, let's start a company, I was determined to take the things that we're working with the people shoe, we were determined, you know, some of the design factors, but then really run it through this whole filter, the look good, do good, feel good filter and focus um, focusing around a, a brand, a logo, and an idea. And that's where we came up with with movement. And when you look at our logo, um, this really cool kind of half half stripe, what that is, it's, it's directional, right? Yeah. And it's it's a reflection of what movement oh, is. We're bringing it down just a little bit more. Oh, oh, you're talking about the arc, okay, cool. Yeah, you see that? It's, it's like an arrow. It's a half arrow. So it's like we're, it's, I feel like half of us, are moving in the right direction and half of us aren't. And half of our technology, it seems like, is going for positive, amazing things. And then kind of half of it isn't. So we want to bring together the, the other half of that arrow. And that's what movement is and, and kind of bringing that into into everybody's daily life to just to start talking about it in the conversation. And that's the, the really neat logo, movement. So you guys get that. So you guys, uh, you know, you guys bring this idea together. You merge your uh, past business venture with a new mission, a new focus. And when did you know that this was a business now? So what, what, what are you doing differently than what you did previously? When did this start gaining traction? Now, you guys are fairly new, though, right? You guys are. We're, we're, we just hit market just over four months ago. Um, when Kevin and I fully came in, um, 
we'd both been we'd been tinkering around with the idea and starting it. As you know, it's it's an experiment. It's like it's no different than painting or in a, being in a band and trying to write an album. You're sitting around tinkering and you're trying to out ideas and you're playing this little lead riff and you're saying, oh, maybe that works." And you're like, "Let's change the tempo up here." That's when you're coming together with the idea. You need to really work on that focus and come together uh, and, and work on all the different elements on it. But there's so much training. Yeah, you know, it's the off season before you're ready to to jump into the fundraising part. Um, so we really sat together and focused um, and worked on on you know designing the logo, designing our slogan, and and our working on our mission statement. We spent. Man, we spent months and months just going back and forth on that and creating, you know, I was creating customer profiles. Well, who is it I want to go after? What I'm looking, writing down, because I'm the creative director and the designer, you know, I started for the first time in my life, okay, well, what is it about design? What am I interested in? You know, what really grabs me? And I started having to analyze everything from the furniture that I keep in my house to the, to the vinyl records, to the music that I listen to, the cars I drive, to the motorcycles I ride. Um, to the surfboards that I surf, like I had to start understanding. Okay, what is it about that design? What's that that defining aspect of it? That attracts and you to those things. Exactly, it makes makes you sit down and put things on paper that otherwise it's very easy to to glance over or to do the the fast run and, and not spend that time and just want to jump right into it. Well, we spent a lot of time. Uh, thanks in part to Kevin. Kevin loves. Kevin loves running the exercises he loves all the i mean i just got a couple emails from him right now um he's constantly reading these uh you know reading a lot of uh, amazing books as, as i like to as well and he likes to apply that and that knowledge immediately he never waits around like a couple months he just if he reads a book and he's inspired just he says i try and apply that we're gonna experiment so then we jumped into fundraising which um which is a process you know that's where you really you're doing your first sales pitches um and I'm really great at sales, and I'm not really great at at the numbers um, and and running uh, business plans and all that stuff. I mean, I can do it, but it it kind of gives me shivers. So yeah. that's amazing about Kevin, um, our CEO, and Chris Swartwood, our CFO. They really a- enjoy doing that sort of thing, and and Kevin was amazing in getting people to. To believe, and so many of our investors believe in in Kevin, and they believe in Chris, and then they would meet me, and um, and I guess I would do the dog and pony show. <laughs> so, wait, Kevin, so you guys didn't even bootstrap, or you guys bootstrap to a certain extent, but you guys were able to raise funding for for the movement. Oh man, we're still bootstrapping it. Um, you know, there's uh, when a when a when a startup comes along, there's never enough money around. Um, you know, it takes as my dad always used to say, it takes money to make money. So yeah. You've got to get money. You've got to get some sort of capital. You can sit around and tinker on it and let it happen, quote unquote, organically, no pun intended. And you can wait around and, and build a business up, and it, it could take you four or five years to get any sort of real traction and get a voice. But for us, being that the what for us, which is trying to stop single use plastics and trying to change the world. Um, you know, through the way that we make our stuff and, and trying to inspire all of our other colleagues and our quote unquote competition to also change the way they make things. For us, there was a sense of urgency um, where we didn't want to sit around and just have this as a hobby for us. Um, we wanted it to be our full time jobs because we were turning down other full time jobs and careers um, to do this. So, and isn't we that always tried- the hardest part? Like, how do you, you know, make that transition from a project to a full fledged? respectable organization um, work focus and creating plans you know creating structure Um, business loves structure you need to have it and you need to sit down and and build it out you need to set yourself with um, with a game plan you need to give yourself we started talking about this last February February 2011 we were Already had money um, raised by April, enough to to get an operations and get an office. And we opened it up an office, and we jumped right into it. And this was through friends and family, or this is through friends and family. So, um, you know, we're we're extraordinarily lucky that that I that I have two amazing business partners, um, Chris Ortwood and and Kevin Flanagan, who 
we're able to to raise um, money relatively easy. When I say relatively easy, this was a process that started in February, March of 2011, and we finished up January 1, 2012. And that was something that required phone calls, emails, business plans, rewriting business plans, um, working on numbers, coming back with those numbers, reworking them, meeting with lawyers, meeting with trademark lawyers, meeting with you name it. I mean, it was a a mountain of work. And I mean, to anybody that's starting a company, I always say it is the best time you'll ever have killing yourself. Yeah. I mean, you are you've got to be all in. You've got to have all of your chips on the table and you better be willing to to wake up at 2 a.m. if you have an idea um, and write it down or if you, if you, I mean, all the time I have deadlines and I'll, you know, I put Monday, I put in a 20-hour day. Yeah. That's how I start my week and sometimes I like doing that just because it gets me a head start on the week a little bit but, you know, when it comes to deadlines, man, I, I go, I, I don't sleep for days at a time um, already. I mean, we've been, you know, just trying to get on calendar and you have to be willing to do that, and I personally love that. I, I don't do well with with idle time. I have about a billion hobbies. Yeah. Um, I have a lot of friends because I'm constantly enjoying, you know, being around people and, and spreading the message. But you've got to find that thing that you're really passionate about, that's very focused and can roll right off your tongue because you're going to be, as I do every single day, um, you're going to be retelling the story all the time, over and, and over. you need to inspire people yourself. You are. You're, 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 you're your best salesman and um, you have to be able to inspire people from your own conversation and, and that comes from knowing your company inside and out, knowing your mission inside and out, knowing your product inside and out and, and knowing the business inside yes, and out. Exactly. Right. Yeah, you need to know where you're at, where you come from and where you're going. Mark, one more question about the product though. You know, um, when people hear about up cycle material being used for products they worried about the consistency have you guys ever had a issue with that or is that a problem that you guys uh, might encounter um, or how are you guys um, preparing for that well um, it's, I, I like that you know you're, you're upcycling Dwight um, and just to clarify for our, our um, your fans out there hopefully my, my future fans um, upcycling means that you're taking something that's Life's product life cycle has come to an end, and it was it was fashioned for one thing, and with a little bit of effort and uh, minor resources put in, you're giving it a second life. You're recreating it. You're repurposing it into um, a second life cycle. Um, very different from recycling. Recycling is where you're taking, um, i.e., let's use the plastic water bottle. You're taking a plastic water bottle, and you are using an incredible amount of energy to heat it up and melt it and then off-gas a ton of really nasty stuff yeah. into the atmosphere. And then what you're doing is you're actually adding more, anywhere from 30 to 70%, even up to 80%, uh, more fresh, to uh, good old delicious toxic petroleum-based chemicals and blasphemals and all that stuff back into this little you know soup just to make the exact same worthless um, single-use plastic bottle. That is not what we are doing. For the consistency, um, again, we were working with. Um, we started working with a group in Bali that has been making and this stuff for years because I've been working with them now for years with my other company, and we've worked it out pretty nicely. But it, you know, that's what in fashion. That's what um, that's what you have samples for. That's what you got to go through the sample runs. So you have your your first round of samples, and then you immediately give notes. Um, and you say, okay, this isn't going to work, and you have to put your thinking hat on and try to uh, see, you know, a, step, a few steps ahead, because you're working on prototypes. And you, you know, the first time we built a shoe out of the upcycled um, plastic, we got the shoe and we put it on our our um, sample model, and had him walk around, and if the shoe was going, <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, okay, right there, you know, until you until you're able to touch it and feel it and hold it, you can't understand. So, and then we also felt like. You know, I could I could just rip it right away. So I realized that we didn't use a thick enough ply. So it's really just getting your hands and your eyes on it, and you have to touch and feel it, and look at it, and you've got to give yourself enough lead time to work out those kinks before you go to market because you don't want to go to market with something that's unproven. But also, at one point, nothing's ever going to be perfect, right? Yeah. Um, Constant evolution. Yeah. Exactly. Right. I mean, um, you know. 
Da Vinci could have toiled on one on one work of art for the rest of his life. Yeah. And at one point, you just have to say, okay, I, it's it's going to be something's not going to be perfect yet. And that's with every season you want to expand and get better and better and better, right? But at one point, you have to just go to market with something that's even if it's just eighty five percent there, then go with it. As long as it's it's you know it's it's the small things. Nothing's going to ever be perfect. It's better to get out there and start making a voice, make a splash, and then be like, you know, what? we could have done this better. You know, our instep can, and that's what we're doing. You know, the first season, we're like, okay, we we got feedback from um, our customers, from friends, and said, okay, well, we need to add an arch cookie. We need to add a more comfort to our instep. That's we're going to spend more money and develop a custom instep. And now, so our fall winter coming out I'm really proud that we've got a whole new instep and that's just our second season we're already making big leaps in innovation and quality and in comfort and with this with product when you're design and when you're in production yeah. you just have to constantly look at your own product and you have to be your own biggest critic and evaluate it yeah yeah you can't just sit back and be like our stuff's so awesome <laughs> you know we're so cool you know you have to you have to be proud of what you do but you also have to be able to look at it through a critical eye. Yeah, Mark, you know, man, I, I, you just dropped so much knowledge. You know, like I, I didn't even have to ask that many questions. You just flowed right into it. But, uh, you know, what would be something that you really want social entrepreneurs that are watching this program, especially the aspiring ones, the ones that want to get started? What would you want them to do? I want them to think outside of the box. Um and I want them to I want them to bring the sexy back. I think that in, in the sustainable um, eco world, a lot of it's just plain and simply very nerdy. Yeah. Um, there's not there's not a lot of uh, of curating that goes along. There's not a lot of artistic integrity. Mm -hmm. And design to me is really um, and not to get uh, theological on you guys, but to me, design is is the the language of of a spirituality of, of of God. And whether I believe in God or whether anybody else believes in God is completely irrelevant. But it's it's design is it's universal, man. It's that being it's able universal. to create something out of nothing. It doesn't matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter if you're Hindu. It doesn't matter if you're black. Yeah. If you're Indian, Mexican, or you know where you come from, what your socioeconomic background is. When a when a '68 fastback silver Mustang drives by you, and it's you know got the tuck and rolled beautiful red interior leather on it, and it goes by with that rumble, and you just look at that thing, I don't care who you are, you're gonna look at that and appreciate the lines on that car, and you can look at it and say, man, somebody really thought that car out. It was built for aerodynamics, it was built for looks and for timelessness like that's a classic look now is that is that the eco-friendly car or the best example i mean it's a big burner but this is before we really knew or understood that but on a pure aesthetic design uh level that is a a beautiful thing that and speaks the attention to me. detail right or even you know if you want to talk say the maybe the most universally known famous piece of artwork the the mona lisa yeah. okay the mona lisa there's something you know that's design it's it's art and it's something that touches there's the coloring there's the shading there's the depth there's real thought there's also symbolism and hidden symbolism that's in there but that went in and that touches people from all over the place and you have to design something if you're designing something that's just niche and you just want to sell a thousand units in Rhode Island then that's fine you can have your really very specific, um, you know, kind of niche product, you know, and just be happy with that. Maybe, you know, maybe that's what you want to do. But for us, our message is, is so important and I feel so urgent about getting that message out where I want to stop the planet from using single-use plastics. I want all manufacturers to eventually, you know, make all of their products out of stuff that is biodegradable, sustainable materials, right? So for us, I, we have to, when I say I, um, Kevin, Chris, and our whole team now, and myself, we have to design stuff from everything from our website to the T-shirts to um, our wallets to our shoes. It has to be able to speak to the masses in a general, and I think that's the hardest thing. Like, how do you make beautiful music that you know now that uh, that a lot of people are going to like, and not just you know six thousand teenagers in Stuttgart, Germany? Yeah. 
you know, cause when you have a message you want to get out there, you have to be able to design universally. So I say, think big picture, think outside of the box. Um, and then p- think of yourself as take the eco story out of it first yeah. and start yourself. If you're, if you're in fashion, then you better be approaching it from a fashion standpoint first. And you better make sure that your designs will stand the test of time and they'll stand up against your competitors because what you find is that that's the first thing that's going to catch somebody's eye. Is it um, good or not? Yeah. And it's, is, is it good or not? Is the, is the shoe going to last? Is it going to be solid? Does it look beautiful? You know, is, it, is, it, is it nice to look at? And does somebody want to wear it? Because all day long I see all these companies that I really admire for you know, the innovations that they're doing and you know for what the companies stand for but so much it just becomes um this kind of static noise that you just you're like oh my god that that shoe is so ugly and their website is just it is so janky and rookie and it just looks it looks terrible and it, as soon as i see that i'm like i'm over that i'm not interested in that and you think that i would be but i i still come from i start off as as a as a as a lover of design and, a, and as a critic, like anybody else is. So be uh, willing and ready to face the critics and get focused. So where are we at now? We said think outside of the box. Um, get you know, focused. Get focused. Be a critic. And, and be a critic. So there we say, we'll say that. <laughs> awesome. Mark, are we leaving drink, anything out, man? Yerba Mate. Yerba Mate is, is amazing. You can drink it all day. It doesn't make you as tweaked as coffee. <laughs> there you go. Mark, are we leaving anything out? Um, I would say this, that um, I think every person can be the change. And for us, the, int- the amazing thing about, uh, about the single-use plastics problem is it's a problem, a problem that's come up very quickly and very recently. And it's a problem that we literally could, if we can get people to join this cause and really get behind it and understand it, we can start a movement. All of us together, and we can do that in a, in a fun way, and we can do it in a way that is very easy to do. You can support the companies that are standing for for positive things, that things that align with your own morals, and then you can choose every day by what you buy. To that that should that should be a direct reflection of your beliefs. So if you like the planet and you want to see, you don't want to see turtles and fish. And, and birds dying from eating plastic and if you like to go eat sushi and don't want to be poisoned and if you like just to go out and, and step into the, uh, into the nature and breathe something, then you should start understanding that every time you purchase something, it is having an effect. Every time you go and get a single-use plastic bottle, chances are that's going to end up being in the ocean. It's going to end up being in our soil. It's going to end up being in our water and part of our food source and it's going to end up coming back to you and you're going to be imbibing it, drinking it and eating it. So, say no to single-use plastics. Every day, I'll say this, you said 50 billion um, plastic uh, water bottles were made last year. Every single day, globally, we consume enough single-use plastics. Those plastic straws they give you at the restaurant when you order a glass of water, your plastic water bottles, a Starbucks uh, lid on your coffee mug. If you line up all those up end-to-end, the amount of single-use plastics we throw away every 24 hours globally will circle the globe four times. Wow. Every 24 hours. Wow. Now, my last little analogy is that the Earth is like okay for me. I'm a pretty strong guy. Uh, you know, I'm a I'm a, a surfer. I'm a traveler. I'm an athlete. I pride myself in being strong and being healthy. You know, mind, body, spirit. Body is a temple. Yeah. Okay, if you throw a kid, you know, if one of my nieces or nephews jumps on my back, I can, you know, sure enough, oh, all right, kid, I got you. I can carry you for a bit. Now, if all eight of my nieces and nephews were to jump onto my back simultaneously, I'm a duck, <laughs> strapped man, right? My knees are going to start buckling, okay? And I'm going to come down. Now, the earth is amazing. The earth is very strong. The ecosystem is so ingenious by its design. It's actually built uh, to withstand a certain amount of, of, of pressure, if you will. But now it can handle one of those kids on its back. But now we're throwing all eight nieces and nephews on the earth's back. And the earth's knees are starting to buckle. And I truly believe that we're at a turning point in civilization and mankind where we need to have a second industrial revolution. We need to change the world. And each the change starts with every person. Yeah. Every Sometimes we feel hopeless watching all this. It's a, it's a political season. It's an election year. 
I've lost my faith in politics, but I have gained my faith in the power of, of one, the power of the individual to be the change. And it starts every single day. And then it's like a virus. One person tells another person. That person tells three people. Those three people tell nine people. Those nine people. And then from there, it's a snowball going down the hill, down Everest. And it turns into an avalanche. And it turns into a movement. So, and that's what social entrepreneurship is all about, man. Right? That's what it should be about. It's okay. I think it's okay. Like I think that's what we're finding is that responsible, socially responsible business, um, business with beliefs and business with moral structure, um, I think has a, a, is a really powerful potential for a new world. Awesome, man. Ladies and gentlemen, do you have it? the co-founder of the People's Movement, Mark Weisbach. Mark, thanks for coming on the program, man. Dwight, so good to meet you, man. I'll bring you a pair of size 13s at the end of the month out to New York. <laughs> awesome, man.